for coming. It's always nice to actually have an audience. It was a beautiful view, but I would have been a bit lonely on my own for half an hour. Um, I think I, I recognise some friendly faces, people that were in my presentation last year, and, and clients, and oh, it's really nice. It's like having friends in the room together. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name's Nicola Ascom. I'm known as the Data Governance Coach, and I need to pay Vanessa for name-dropping several times <laughs> during her presentation earlier. Um, but I, I found my, my thing about data governance um, uh, nearly 17 years ago. Just I realised how important it was and how valuable it was. Um, and um, we were having a conversation just at the beginning. I think the trouble with data governance is people don't see it as the cool stuff. It's not the exciting, sexy side of data. I mean, we've had two keynotes, and what they've been about artificial intelligence <laughs> and it is, it, I think that's absolutely amazing so exciting the things that you can do are amazing but you've got to have good data to do it you've got to know what data you've got and how good or or otherwise it is and I think that's where data governance comes in so I'm assuming you're all working in data governance or trying to so I actually think we're the ones putting in those solid foundations and um, people can't do the exciting cool stuff without us and so if, if they haven't Right, realize that in their, your organization, you need to go and tell them you need us so you can do the cool stuff. Um, and I can say, I like, I like that kind of tag. One of my clients said that last week. Uh, I was at a conference a couple of weeks before that, and somebody kind of went, oh, well, Nicola does the boring but important stuff. And I went, I'm sure there's a nicer way of putting that. So when my client last week said, data governance enables others to do the cool stuff, I went, I like that tagline better <laughs> than rather than Nicola does the boring but foundational important stuff. We do really critical stuff for our organizations and we need to blow our own trumpet. Um, now, I can't in half an hour tell you everything you need to do about data governance. But what I do want to talk about is writing a data governance policy for you. So, and, and you can see that you know I've, I've highlighted the word that I think is the most important one because anybody can write a bad policy, <laughs> really, really easy. Um, but if your policy is going to help you actually deliver your data governance um, initiative and help it be successful, then it needs to be a good data governance policy. So um, I'm going to hopefully give you some tips and and hopefully have a bit of time at the end for questions because I don't know about you, but when I go to conference. I'm always thinking about, well, what does this mean to me back in the real world when I get back to work tomorrow or, or Monday? And I'm thinking, yeah, but what does this mean? And so I always like to have a bit of time at the end so that we can you know, answer any of your questions that you may have. So why a data governance policy? Now, I learnt my lesson, this is my third year at Data 2020, and I'm used to doing a lot of presenting in the UK, and people talk back to me. And the first year, I stood on the stage and I asked a question, and you all look blankly at me, and I'm going, hello, I'm the mad English woman, you're supposed to answer back, otherwise I feel very uncomfortable. But I'm going to say most of the time is, you know, just raise your hands. But, you know, perhaps if you, you want to call out why you think you need a data governance policy. Any, any ideas? I'm not going, to make, not going to force you to talk, because I know you don't like to. <laughs> So I actually think that a data governance policy is absolutely vital. I think it's fair to say, first couple of, maybe even three or four times I did data governance, I didn't have one. And it was only as good as somebody thought it was a good thing to be doing. It was flavor of the month. It had no official mandate. We had no official support from somebody senior in the company. So I learned really quickly that actually we do need to have a data governance policy. It's actually the foundation of our framework. And yes, you know, when it comes to all things data governance, I think that some of them are more boring than others, and, and perhaps the policy isn't the most exciting thing. It's an official document that once you've gone through the pain of doing it, allows you to get on with the exciting data governance stuff. But it is the absolute foundation. And just like a foundation of a building, you actually find that your data governance policy, once it's done, is relatively unseen. Most organisations I've worked with have an annual review of policies. I don't know if you're the same. Um, so, yes, it will come to light once a year, get reviewed, <laughs> put away again. But it's actually what that enables you to do that is really, really key. And that is why we need to do one. Now, over the years that I've been doing data governance, I've worked out my own methodology for how to design and implement a data governance framework that is going to be successful for you. Bearing in mind that every organisation you work for is going to be different. So, I've just shared one, well, a couple of triangles from my methodology in this slide. So, and these are the three things I think are absolutely vital. They're the three components of your data governance framework. And as you can see, policy is the first one on my triangle. And I think you need to do that before you even worry about writing processes, defining your roles and responsibilities. Now, you need a data governance policy because it is almost like the mandate. 
it, this is somebody saying, actually, our organization takes data governance seriously. And it also gives that message. Because what you're trying to achieve, and I'm sure you all realize this, is actually a culture change. We're trying to get everybody in our organization to start thinking about data. Do you think they think about data now, or do they think whatever it is you do? So we've got a lady here who generates hydroelectric power. We've got people that make furniture in the room, and I don't know about the rest of you. But you know, they are two perfect examples of you know, where does the data come in that? But yet you know that the data is absolutely vital. Otherwise, you know, we can't manage what we're doing, what we're selling, our services and our products. So it's, it's really important to get that um, data under control, regardless of your industry. And the policy actually sends a very loud statement that some senior executives in your organization have signed off to say, data is an asset for us, and we're going to manage it like an asset. And we're not going to just let data be. I've, I've had people say it's almost like a, an inconvenience that I have to deal with in my job. It's the things that you know, make my life frustrating because the data's always wrong when I have to do something. And we're working around it. But we're actually going to stop that. We're going to go to being proactive in managing our data so it can deliver real value to our organization. <clears throat> so the policy is key because that is what sends the message out there. Also, if, if you, any of you work in regulated industries, um, particularly financial services, anything where your regulator asks for data governance, having a policy is a huge piece of evidence so that when they come and ask you, how are you managing your data, you go, ha-ha, here's my policy. Um, and also, nobody can get away from GDPR these days. So as we all know, GDPR, data protection. Not quite the same thing as data governance, but GDPR did ask for a number of requirements that you can only deliver by having a good data governance framework in place. So even if you're struggling to find any other reason to do data governance, to help meet the GDPR requirements, particularly in an ongoing and sustainable manner, is another good driver. And again, if your um, information commissioner or, or whatever they're called in your country comes calling, data governance policy is going to be a really good document. So that's the kind of boring compliance reasons why you want them but you actually need it to kind of focus people's minds on, on what you're doing. But before I talk any more about the policy, I wanted to say that there's one thing that you have to do before you even pick up your pen to start drafting. It's, or to be honest, yeah, it's a bit old fashioned. I do like pen and paper, but let's face it, probably drafting a policy on, on our computers and typing. Why are you doing data governance? You know, just because it seemed like fun? You heard a mad English woman speak at a conference and you thought we, we ought to adopt that then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but it's that kind of, why are you doing it? And I, I really recommend you, you don't look for the generic benefits that you can find online. I mean, I've shared them online loads of times. You can go and find it on my website. But they're not why your organization's doing it. They might be good places to look at and try and identify what is it. But why does your particular company need data governance? Because once you've identified that, then you're in a good position to write a policy that delivers that. So I would recommend that you go and look at your corporate strategy, your business strategy. What are your goals for the next five years? And then look and know with the knowledge that you've got of your company's data, where is our data not good enough to meet those strategic goals? And what do we need to do with the data to actually enable that? And that will tell you where you need to focus. And with that in mind, you're then able to write a data governance policy. So I need to ask a question. Who here has Googled for a data governance policy? Thank you for being honest. Because, <laughs> I mean, let's face it, why wouldn't you? Have you ever written one before? <laughs> so, I mean, and to be honest, I would have done, except there were none when I did my first one. There was just hardly anything. Now there's loads. So. Um, you know, this is really easy. We don't need to go and listen to Nicola tell us how to do a data governance policy. We'll just Google it. And, uh, and you know, in case you haven't seen it, that one's actually a PDF. We can download it. We can, we can do find and replace and replace that company's name with our own. Yeah, so <laughs> anybody tempted? <laughs> oh, you are good people. This is how I'm preaching to the converted. I don't need to tell you this. Um, I can't tell you how many people I've been to that actually have done that. And it's really bad. Um, and I've actually done some work um, in the UK the last couple of years with universities. The higher education regulator has been asking them to adopt data governance. And I went into one client who was an insurer, not anything to do with higher education. And um, I recognized the policy. 
who is one that I'd actually um, seen somebody I'd been working with. I'd read it and I recognised the style. And they had done that and they'd left some jargon in there that is unique to universities and has no relevance in an insurance company. And I'm reading it going, how is this going to help? <laughs> so, um, but I think the trouble is, you know, you're obviously all there or in the middle of it, just about to start. Data governance is a long journey. Um, you know, I know Vanessa was kind of, you know, perhaps a little depressing, saying it's really hard to do data governance. It's hard to do data governance, but it is doable, and you can do it successfully. You just need to be aware of all the challenges and things that are coming. So, um, but one of the ways to fast track it is not <laughs> to go to Google and download your policy. It might be worth having a look. And to be fair, um, on like my training course, I give away a, a few examples um, just to get people going. But I always say, don't copy this. <laughs> Work out that use it for inspiration for your own one. Because who here works for a bog standard company? You're all unique. And even if you're in an industry that has loads of competitors, you know, is your organization identical to the next one? I've done loads of work with insurance companies in the last few years because of one of their regulations. Um, required that they did data governance. And I can tell you that of all the insurance companies I've worked with, I haven't written the same data governance policy for them all, even though they're to meet the same regulatory requirement, because we've got to do something that's right for each organization. So hopefully I believe you. Anybody want to challenge me and going to like, secretly go home and Google and find this one? I mean, I've got the link if you want it. <laughs> but no, this is good. So. I think this is what else happens. I talk ahead of my slides. It doesn't work because you don't work for a, a standard company and you'd, you know, you've picked up one that was written for somebody else. So it's not going to work for you. But how, you know, what's more important is how do you go about this? Has anybody here written one, trying to write one at the moment? Oh, so it is early days. H how's it going? Is it easy? <laughs> Why is it hard? Anybody that's brave enough to talk? <laughs> Yeah, and data governance is a really bad word, isn't it? <laughs> it's not a helpful one for us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, and I, and I think that is the trouble, isn't it? Is that, you know... What are you going to write that's going to get people excited about this thing that has a really bad job title, but you know we're not going to win that one, so we've just got to spend our efforts convincing people that data governance is good. But you put data and governance in the same sentence. Yes. So, so one of my top tips, I actually just got it on the slide, is actually don't necessarily call it a data governance policy. Um, I've, I've worked with a number of clients where we've called it a data quality policy, because that's the primary reason you're doing it, isn't it? So if we can d call it a data quality policy or even a data policy, is, you know, sometimes, you know, we just have to say hey, the, the name's not helping. Let's call it something better. Um, but actually, how you need to go about writing one, it's really important that you write one for you. So the first thing we're going to do is involve the right people. Now, by this, I don't mean just you and maybe your wider team. So kind of there's you sitting at your laptop on your own. That doesn't work. Um, I had a prospect call with somebody last year. I'm quite glad I didn't get the work, which sounds a terrible thing to say. This chap was new to the company, first ever data governance manager. He's been there four months and hasn't left his desk. He has researched online, and he has spent four months designing the perfect data governance framework. He's written the policy. He's drafted all the roles and responsibilities. He's done all those lovely swim lane diagrams for the processes, and he hasn't talked to anyone. <laughs> and he goes and shares it, and the very first person he meets, he goes, hello, look at this. And you go, well, that won't work here. <laughs> and he's kind of, he's back to square one. Um, so definitely don't sit and do this on your own. That's not going to work. You'd be like this poor chap. Um, you know, perhaps you're thinking, you know, we're part of a bigger team, I'll talk to those people. And that they're helpful, definitely get your wider team involved, but you don't want to stop there. Now, you need to be thinking bigger because, um, as, the, as the lady kindly said, you don't want this to look like something you're doing and imposing on people. And one of the best ways to do that is to get them to help you write it in the first place. So that you're delivering what they ask for instead of you giving them a policy that you're doing to them, which is never a good way to do change. So on this slide, these are kind of, this is an extra freebie, not in the policy at all. Well, you might mention them 
a little bit. But these are kind of the six best practice roles and responsibilities that I have in my head when I'm starting to um, help clients design data governance frameworks. Now, at this stage, bearing in mind we're only just doing the early stages of a policy, you won't have all of these. You might not have decided whether you're having all of these in place. You won't have decided what you're going to call them because names of roles is just the same as I was saying for names of policies. Call it something that works in your organization. But you do need to have an idea of who your data owners are going to be. Who are the senior people in your organization that you want to be accountable for the quality of one or more sets of data? Now, you don't need to go up to them and say, hello, my name's Nicola, I'm writing the data governance policy. I think you might be a data owner, so I want you involved. Probably best not to go in with that because you'll set them running and say, I don't know what this is on, but I'm not playing any part of this. But you need to get the people you know, you've worked in your organizations you know, long enough or people in your team have, to identify who you think your likely candidates are and find your key ones. Maybe not, unless you're, you're going to start doing data governance in HR, perhaps don't worry about the HR data owner, but think about the ones where you know they've got real meaty data problems. They're going to need your help. And then you can actually start them engaging with your program really early on by saying, we're, we're going to do this data governance, we're going to help you, but you, you're such an important person and consumer or producer of data in this organization, I'd like you involved in the policy. So don't tell them that they're data owners, but they're, they're now on your hit list. Um, and you can get them involved and start getting their input into your policy. Because even if you give them the ideas that they then give back to you. <laughs> they feel like they've had their, their views and they've been incorporated into the policy. So um, I'm sorry for the people in the room that have probably heard this before, but my husband thinks that my job is to manipulate people. And I said to him, I far prefer the word influence. It's far nicer. <laughs> but that is absolutely what I do, is I'm trying to get senior stakeholders to realize that the one thing that's missing in their life is data governance, and that it's going to solve all the problems that they have in their particular department or function. Maybe a little bit extreme, but you have to aim high, don't you? And then if you get halfway, you're doing really, really well. So get, get out potential data owners but just and, and give them ideas that, and let them think they were theirs. You don't need to say, great, that's what I was going to put in the policy anyway. You just go, oh, that's a fabulous idea. We'll put that in. So now I've told you how to manipulate your senior stakeholders. <laughs> we, we need to find somebody even more senior than them. So it's working, just a slight delay. Who here has an executive sponsor for their data governance program? Excellent. Uh, a few more of you need to. <laughs> just, just, a kind, just a kind of observation that there was very few people put their hands up there. Um, you need an executive sponsor who is the one that is going to say, in our company, we need to worry about our data. So all the things I was saying about the policy at the beginning, we're, we're viewing it as our asset. We're going to manage this as our asset. You need somebody really senior taking that message out for you and pushing you on that one. So if you haven't got one, I would go and find one. They'll also help your, your program in all sorts of other ways. But I would also get your executive sponsor involved in drafting the policy. Now, that sounds like, you know, actually, they're really, really senior, Nicola. Why are they going to come and talk to me? You only need half an hour of their time for them to think they've been involved. But you could get them to put pressure on perhaps these your, your target data owners to come to a workshop with you. They can open doors and remove obstacles for you. So definitely get them on board. Get them, because actually they're likely to be the key person or one of the key people that sign off your policy. So don't wait until it's all beautifully drafted and you've wordsmithed it, it's looking gorgeous to give it to them. Get them involved in the early stages. So that when they come to sign it off, they've been bought in from the beginning. So it's going to be really hard for them not to sign it off and approve it. So I'm not stopping there, though. <laughs> There's some more people we need to get involved. And we have, sorry, keep an eye on the, uh, the time, but we've got loads. You've got some key producers and some key consumers of data in your organization. Now, I generally say everybody in your organization consumes or produces data or probably does a bit of both. But... We can't go and get your whole organization. I mean, I don't know how many people you've got in your organization, but even if you're a small company and only has 500 people, you're not going to get 500 people together in a room so you can discuss the data governance policy. But why don't you look at the people that are the key consumers of data, the ones who feel the most pain. See, it doesn't seem to matter which industry I've worked in. Uh, finance departments always have trouble with data. And if finance is full of accountants. They like precision. So they're always a, a, a good, <laughs> good people to get involved. So get them along. So you've now identified them. And then there's a final kind of block of people, and I kind of 
generally don't know what to call them, Le your legal people, your risk people, your compliance people. These are the people that know the regulations, the laws that your company has to abide by. And they would be good people that to get involved to say, actually, did you know we have to comply with this um, legislation, so data is good for that, because they might want you to get a very certain wording into your policy. So they're good people. Now, wh what are you going to do with all these people? <laughs> you know, I've told you that's quite a list of people, potentially, I'm assuming. It's, this isn't just like one or two people that you thought you could just quickly write a policy. It is worth the effort, though, because if you identify the right people, the next thing we can do is start agreeing some principles. Now, by this, I mean, you know, some, some short statements that we can actually base our policy around. Now, I thought, you know, what's a good data governance presentation without a nice definition? So, <laughs> so the principles definition. And I think what I like about this is it's saying it's a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behaviours. Now, I would love that you achieve a culture change so dramatic that data governance becomes a system of beliefs. But let's not aim too high at this stage. Let's go for just the a system of behaviours would be better. I think that's probably more achievable in the short term. But these are going to be those statements that are fundamental to how you manage data in your organisation. Now, I never used to have principles in my data governance policies. I just used to go through, we should have these things covered, and I would have a section and, and put some detail in each section of the things that I knew we had to cover. And then I, I don't know why I started doing principles. <laughs> Sometimes I think I just got lucky into how I've worked out how, how things work in data governance. But if you agree a list of principles, and they, your senior stakeholders, all the people we've just been discussing, agree to those. You can write a policy that delivers those principles. The principles can be in your policy. But they've already signed off on those principles. It's going to be really hard for them to then say, well, I don't like the policy. And you go, well, hang on, well, it's, it's the principles that you agreed. Now, you know, you might be thinking, yeah, but what does she mean? What principles? So I can't give them all to you because, again, they've got to be the right ones for you. <laughs> but I kind of think about things like, all data has a data owner. You know, absolutely all data in our organisation has somebody who's accountable for it and who worries about it. Um, we could say that the most critical data is identified and proactively managed. So um, one of the concepts that I love doing, and it doesn't matter a sector, it originated from a, a regulatory requirement in the insurance sector, is the concept of materiality. So if you make things, you might want to call it criticality because you've got material data meaning something else. Um, but this is the idea that you want to put proportionate effort into the data that is the most critical to your organisation. And you don't want to monitor and manage every last bit of information. Now, this is a really good concept to get into your principles because you're actually saying to the company as a whole, we're not going to ask you to do an undue amount of effort if it's not necessary. And if somebody has agreed to that a, a certain set of data is critical to your business, either to a business process or to meet a regulatory requirement, how can they then say, we don't need to define it and monitor its data quality? <laughs> so we can put principles that say, we're going to identify our most critical data and manage that appropriately. Or we can say things like, data quality issues are resolved as close to the source of the issue as possible. Now, I don't know what you're doing at the moment. Before anybody does data governance, Data quality activities tend to exist in the company, but it tends to be somebody is using data, they realise it's wrong, but they fix it at the point they use it. They fudge it, they cleanse the spreadsheet before they load it into their model. They kind of realise that some data is missing and they know where else you can go and get it and they supplement it. But that becomes an industry. Um, I, w I went to a conference recently where somebody called it a data fix factory. <laughs> It's going to, and, and people don't even realise that's what they're doing. Um, and we need to start saying things like, well, you're not allowed to fix your issues at the point of consumption. You fix your data quality issues at the point of origination. Now, notice that I didn't set the bar too high, though, because quite often that data comes from either outside your organisation or even you're reliant on your consumers. So if you're um, a service industry or somebody that sells products to individuals, quite often these days there's online portals, everybody puts their data in, and it's amazing how unreliable we, um, people are about their own data. I mean, I've been pre-GDPR, I've been known to deliberately put my phone number and email address wrong so they can't contact me. <laughs> so, so, and I should know better. I know how important data quality is. So we can't necessarily go and educate all our customers and tell them that they have to put data quality right. So this is why I say as close to the source as is appropriate. And ideally, at the source, if it's in your control, in your organisation, go and do that. So those are only three. 
Um, I don't try to think how many principles should you aim for. Now, the last company I helped write a policy, we had six. That felt really nice. I did a review of a policy for a client last week and they had 12 and it started feeling a, quite a lot to get your head around. <laughs> So there's somewhere between that, there's probably a sweet spot. But what I would say is you want to identify what are the fundamental truths that you want to base your data governance framework on. Now, how I get to these is I run a workshop or two if you can't get everybody in the room at the same time. And I literally just say to them, you've all agreed that data is really important to you and it's really important to our organisation as a whole. What do you think is really important? Now, I would be lying if I didn't know that I was going in there with a number of these in my head to prompt, but it comes back to this, let people think it was their idea. And if they don't come up with any, ask some questions. So you could say, so do you think it's important that we worry about where we fix data quality issues? You know, do we need to have an owner for everything? So you don't need to say, I've got an idea of some principles, you do agree them, great, thanks, we'll all go now and have a coffee. You, you get them to engage and think through these. Once you've got the list of these principles, you send it round to them, and that's when people get picky, particularly when they're seen as stakeholders like this, and they change the words, and the meaning's the same, but if they're happy, <laughs> they've changed the words they've bought in. That means they're going to sign it off. And I get them, obviously not, it's not a policy level sign off, but I get them to sign off that these are the principles we've agreed on the back of that workshop. And that, since I've been doing that, getting the policy signed off is easy. Before that, it felt like I was jumping through hoops, going through so many hurdles, keep rewriting it and tweaking these words. But you get the principles right, and the rest of it seems to follow. So I would do that. And one tip, actually, um, wasn't in my notes, but just occurred to me. Um, I, felt I was recommending an app last year that I started using. It's a transcription app, which uses artificial intelligence, called otter.ai. And you can record up to about 600 minutes free a month and then I, I've, I use it loads and I never go over the 600 minutes and it's relatively cheap if you go over that. I ask people if it's okay because of GDPR <laughs> to record the workshop and it is really good and it, it works out the different voices. So it segments the sections. So, because if you are running this workshop and facilitating it on your own and trying to make the key notes so that when you write it up afterwards, you haven't missed somebody's pet principle that wanted to be included. Otter is a fabulous um, transcription app. I use that a lot when, when I get permission to do so, obviously. But that is really good. So you've done your workshop, you've got your principles agreed. So you're doing really, really well now. You're nearly there. Um, because all you've got to do now, oh, so we, yeah, we are, we're going. Excellent. Just a slight delay. <laughs> we should have got to write the rest of the detail. <laughs> so, but this is easy because we've agreed the principles. Now all you've got to do is write some detail that says how we're going to deliver those principles, how, how we're going to meet it. Um, so this is going to be really easy. But before I want, you know, what, you've got to think about the level of detail. So Pavla said nobody wants to read 10 pages. I've actually seen some, actually, I may have had a hand in writing one that was 26 pages long. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and I did, um, I, the, the one I reviewed last week for a client was one page. This company has decided that they're going for policy on a page. And it literally was, but they'd got rid of all the stuff that you know uses up. The, you know, you got the title page, then the version control, then the distribution list, then the sign-off list. So they've got rid of all of that, and there was a lot of that in my 26-page one. But um, the level of detail um, is going to differ. I'll be honest, because what do you do now in your organisation? You know, I I wrote one a couple of years ago for somebody that was six pages long, including all my distribution lists and, and everything. And I was quite proud of it. I, I would actually say, I've written quite a few now, but every one I write is my favourite one because I've had more practice. And I keep thinking, this is the best one. I've cracked it. This is great. And um, you give it to the client and go, yes, isn't this good? And they go, oh, that won't stand up here. And I'm going, what? I was really pleased with this. I thought it was succinct. I'd got rid of all the waffle. And they went, oh, no, no. Policies have to be a weighty tome here, otherwise they're not taken seriously. And I went, but then I'm, you want me to just put waffle in it <laughs> to pad it out so that it gets to this, this level so that people think it's serious. But I, I'm finding generally that's quite rare these days. It's more erring on the side of we want things that are going to help us focus on something's important and what we need to do at a very high level. So with that in mind, I would say shorter is better, but I would look at your other policies in your organisation because you, you're going to do enough change doing data governance. You don't want to try and convince people that now's the time to revamp your whole organisation's approach to writing policies. So look at what policies you have already and decide, 
you know, if they're six pages long, aim for six. If they're 100 pages long, good luck. But, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to find ways of doing this. So we're at 10.30 already, so I will quickly whiz. So, but I just wanted to give you some things you might want to include in your policy to help you deliver these principles that you've agreed. Is I would always include the scope. Is this all data in your organization or just some? Scope can always change over time, but, but explain in there the scope, because you don't want to get everybody really scared going, do you know how much data we've got? And you're saying this applies to everything from tomorrow. So definitely put that in. Include the roles and responsibilities, but not huge role descriptions. Just kind of say, we're going to have data owners. They're going to be supported by data stewards. And you know, there's going to be a central team called data governance team, data quality team, whatever you want to call it, that support it. So get that high level in there. I'd mention what processes you're going to have or at least initially, get those in there. But again, you don't need your swim lane diagrams. You just need a, we're going to have a data quality issue resolution process so that people can notify us of data quality issues and we can take appropriate action to investigate and fix them. And you might want to put in there, I say data quality standards, but what I actually mean is where you will have data quality standards. This isn't a list of all the standards, but just a, you know, is all data going to have data quality standards? So by this, I go back to the when we were talking about principles about the critical data. Perhaps that's one of the things that you do to differentiate. If that data is absolutely critical to your organization, wouldn't that be good data to have data quality standards for that you monitor against? So you kind of explain that in the policy. And also data definitions. Now, I'm a data governance geek. I'm going to tell you, you need definitions of everything. It's absolutely vital. You're not going to get that in. Nobody's going to agree to that. So again, work out on what basis are you going to start getting people completing your data glossary or your business glossary, whatever you're calling it. So it could be that you, you insist on that if there's a new system. You could say, we're building a new data warehouse or a data lake, and you only put data in there if you have a data definition in place. Or we could say, we're just going to have high level conceptual definitions for everything. But you decide what you want, and you get that put in your, in your um, policy. So I don't think the data governance policy will be easy, but hopefully a little bit easier for you <laughs> now that I've told you my top tips on how I write them these days. Um, and oops, I know a lot of you have been photographing the slides. I think they get sent out by Hypright anyway, so you will have them. But I've also I always try and make people's life easier. That's kind of my mission, to make as many people successful with data governance as possible. And all the tips, apart from maybe the Otter um, app and the things that I've thought about on the fly, <laughs> are in just a document you can download on my website. So feel free to go and download that. There's loads of other free resources on my website. As I said, I'm always trying to help people do this. And I did put a question slide, but I'm going to have to finish because somebody else is needing to talk soon, I assume. <laughs> but I'm here all day. I have to go before the very end to get a flight. But um, lunchtime, all the coffee breaks, if you want to come and ask me questions, feel free. But thank you very much. Thank you.